Good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Berry. I'm the president here for Skudik Institute at Acadia National Park, and it is my pleasure to welcome you this evening for a talk that is co-sponsored by Skudik Institute and Penobscot East Resource Center. I'm going to just say a couple words about the institute and who we are and what we do, and then hand the microphone off to Robin Alden, who will introduce Ted Ames. So Skudik Institute is a nonprofit that is a close partner to Acadia National Park in management of this facility as an education and research center and in many aspects of science and education within the park and for the region. We broadly support Acadia's priorities of better understanding and preparing to respond to rapid environmental change. That work is undergoing is constantly in progress. The park resource management staff are, as of right now, one day into a three-day conservation planning process that I was participating in this morning. And we will be hosting later this fall a climate change scenario planning workshop for the park. But throughout the year, we are constantly working to facilitate and encourage research that is relevant to the park's natural and cultural resources and how they may experience change as we go forward. The Park Service has broadly recognized that it is no longer possible to steward natural and cultural resources unimpaired for future generations, that we instead need to learn to understand change and manage for as much resilience and the values that we care about within that context. For Skudik Institute, a big priority for us is engaging the public in the scientific process. So although not all of the research we're involved with does that, we seek that opportunity, whether it is the middle school students that start arriving tomorrow morning for three-day residential experiences, and we'll have about 800 of them this fall between now and Thanksgiving, or high school students and teens that participate in week-long science opportunities here during the summer, or programs that connect with students in their own communities all across the state, or partnerships that bring citizen science to a much wider audience, such as through the Citizen Science Association, where we're working to really advance the field. And we focus on that approach of engaging the public in science because we believe in its power to advance the research, that there are a lot of questions that can be better asked by involving the public in gathering and contributing data or involving the public in designing and contributing to the concepts involved in the science, and because we believe in it as a powerful and inspirational educational approach that gives people awareness of the scientific process as well as content knowledge or awareness of specific scientific information. I won't take the time to go through all of the programs that we're involved with, but I do hope that if you are new to us tonight, that you will stay connected with us through our website at skudikinstitute.org by visiting us here in person, uh, getting on our email newsletter list, or calling us anytime you might have questions or ideas for us. With that, I want to introduce Robin Alden, uh, the Executive Director of the Penobscot East Resource Center and a friend. And Robin has dedicated her career to working for fishing communities in the state of Maine and continues to lead that in truly innovative ways at Penobscot East Resource Center. It's a pleasure for us to co-host this with Penobscot East. This is the second of four fish talks that Penobscot East offered this year. Uh, two of them uh, we co-sponsored, uh, including tonight's talk. So with that, Robin will say a word about Penobscot East and then introduce our featured speaker tonight, Ted Ames. Thank you, Mark. And uh, it's lovely to be doing this together um, with the Skudig Institute. Uh, Penobscot East Resource Center is a sustainable fisheries organization that's uh, based in Stonington, Maine. We're right on the waterfront there. And we work principally from Penobscot Bay east to the Canadian line. And the work we're doing there, we think is um, a model for how fisheries can be done in the future. We're really long-term thinkers working to uh, build 
the sustainability of these communities so that they know that they can depend on fishing, even though it may not look like what it does right now. We're pretty sure it won't. Um, as climate change comes along, um, we're facing the fact that actually the ocean always is changing, and that in fact to live with, for human beings to live within the means of the marine environment that they're living adjacent to, that means co constantly adapting. So um, it, it's no surprise that it's very compatible to work with Skudik Institute because their focus on science and getting the community involved in science is very similar to what we are doing over the very long term, getting fishermen's observations into regular science and getting fishermen involved in monitoring and responding to the changes that are happening all the time in the ocean so that we can make smarter decisions in the future. That's what we're about. Um, we, we believe that fishermen are, we're convinced, and I think tonight's talk will show you a good example of this. We're convinced that the type of observation that fishermen do of the natural world as they're pursuing whatever they're pursuing um, is invaluable additional observation time that is going to contribute to our understanding of what is actually a pretty invisible world um, out there under the ocean. Fishermen don't see at microscopic scale, they don't see at a global scale, but they know an awful lot about the places where they're operating. <clears throat> it's for too long, we've told fishermen, I'd be extremely surprised if what you're saying is true, or I don't know, we've never, that's not the way the system works. And in fact, their observations are good questions that then can turn out to be better science. So our programs involve um, uh, a variety of things. We are piloting co-management of scallops in Maine. Um, Eastern Maine is where the scallop industry happens. Uh, we've got, we've worked with the state and with fishermen in all these communities in Eastern Maine to try to come up with more sensible scallop rules that give us a fishery that can last all, all um, winter and give people a winter's pay and still leave scallops for the next year. Um, that's a major initiative and now after fishermen have drawn lines and the state has accepted them, now we're moving into, okay, so how do we measure what we're doing? How do we learn whether we've done this right? So we're moving into the science and the community science uh, stage of this. We also have a high school program that is working in eight high schools from Vinyl Haven to Jonesport Beals. We had 60 kids in seven schools last year. This year we'll have eight schools and we'll find out in the next few weeks how many kids we have. This is a in-school program for kids who are interested in learning regular academics through fisheries questions, and we're very excited about it. Um, and the idea is the fishermen of the future need to be stewards with, with government, with science, and uh, this is how to prepare them. So tonight, I have the opportunity not to introduce a friend, but to introduce a husband. Um, <laughs> so this is a little odd, but, uh, but I certainly can give him a good bio. Um, Ted Ames is one of those fishermen who spent his life fishing, observing, and when he got older and wasn't fishing in the winter, started fishing on the computer, uh, looking at mapping where fish used to be based on fishermen's uh, accounts and what he knew. And he discovered something that probably no scientist or no fisherman by themselves could have done. He, the combination of fisherman and science mind put something together and he learned something about codfish that people hadn't known, which is that they, were, they exist in smaller subpopulations. Well, now in the last few years, he's been trying to figure out how, what's gonna bring those fish back. So tonight he's going to be talking to you about the alewives in the rivers. Um, Ted started out fishing out from Vinyl Haven. He eventually was persuaded to go to college. As soon as he got out of college, he was uh, determined to go back fishing. Um, a car accident put him in the classroom in high school for a few years till he recovered, and then he went back fishing. He's fished, uh, started out lobstering, he's fished dragging, he's fished um, shrimping, scalloping, gill nuts, and now he's lobstering again. So, typical life cycle for an owner-operator fisherman, and um, 
a very good storyteller. So Ted, welcome. There we are. <laughs> Thank you. It's a treat to see you all here, and I'm just delighted to see so many old friends and faces here. Uh, this perhaps airs why one should be very cautious about letting old curmudgeon fishermen come ashore. There's no telling what sort of problems they can create before it's over with. My talk today involves codfish and uh, ends up talking about alewives as well. Uh, takes some new information that surfaced from some elegant research projects and tries to tie them together with what happened to all of the codfish along Maine's whole coast, including New Hampshire and more recently, Massachusetts. Uh, uh, with that, uh, I will see if we can start the trip. Um, my work really started uh, and hinged on three pieces of, of research. This first one, the Talic uh, Cod Study, which involved uh, uh, GMRI down in Portland, National Marine Fisheries Service, uh, Canadian DFO in tracking codfish, uh, tracked over 110,000 codfish, tagged them. Uh, the tan squares that you see sprinkled around on the, on the uh, chart are where the fish were tagged. The black dots are where the fish were recovered. And lo and behold, uh, you can see that literally from Casco Bay, the eastern side near Portland, all the way to Canada, there were no tag returns at all. Uh, that represents fully half of the entire coastal shelf of the Gulf of Maine, devoid of fish. And predictably, for the last 20, 25 years, there have been no ground fishermen in that area. No fish means no fishermen. Unwritten law of the sea, I'm afraid. Whoops. Uh, the second piece of information that I relied quite heavily on was a report by U.S. Fish, uh, Commissioner of Fisheries, Spencer Baird, who wrote uh, in 1873 that because the dams had blocked runs of alewives, causing them populations to collapse, the codfish had abandoned the shore. And to restore that vibrant fishery, we had to remove a whole bunch of dams. The plot thickens. Because more recently, George Rose in 2000 uh, argued that the reason the codfish in northern Newfoundland collapsed was because uh, there was a huge school of capelin that particular year, and the codfish throughout the area hyper-aggregated into a huge school in the immediate vicinity and stayed there until they were all caught up, and the fishery collapsed. Well, some of us looked at it and said, well, that's a stretch. I'm not so sure about that. But uh, last year, Richardson and cohorts from National Marine Fisheries Service uh, examined the data from the collapse of codfish on Stellwagen Bank in Massachusetts Bay and 
found that there had been a huge bloom of sandlands. They're a tiny, lipid-rich prey, similar in nutrient content to capelin. Uh, and virtually all of the codfish in the immediate vicinity gathered on Stellwagen Bank, and they stayed there. They stayed until they were virtually caught up and codfish in Mass Bay collapsed, and are collapsed. If codfish coalesce around a whole bunch of uh, lipid-rich prey, that has interesting ramifications. So uh, we should look at that. Basically, my work extends Baird's assertion that cod stayed near concentrations of alewives, in particular. They are another lipid-rich prey. The Gulf of Maine used to have three of these critters, alewives uh, and bluebacks I lumped together, but also Atlantic herring and menhaden. Well, we pretty well cleaned out the menhaden. Uh, we stoppered up the alewives a long time ago, and of recent years, we've been extracting an awful lot of adult herring from the Gulf of Maine stock. So we live in a brave new world. But before we go too far, uh, you can't look at codfish alone, or even codfish and alewives alone. They were part of a community of species that used to live on the coastal shelf before we help them move along to our dinner plates. Uh, some of them you're very familiar with, pollock, haddock, cod, white hake, cusk, the list goes on. But these are some of the ones that uh, could be tracked historically, which reflects my database from the 1920s. Another thing we have to be aware of is that adult herring and adult alewives all migrate south in the fall. And they don't come back until the following spring. They start camping somewhere in the vicinity of Ipswich Bay and will overwinter all the way down to uh, Block Island. And alewives are found farther, though I'm not sure Gulf of Maine varieties do. So they're not the prey base of the codfish that used to live along the shore or the haddock. Their progeny were. Young of your alewives leave their rivers in late summer and stay in coastal estuaries near natal rivers until the end of their first year, and they start migrating elsewhere come the following fall. They have company in the same estuaries, Atlantic herring. But Atlantic herring have a different uh, uh, life stage, different life stages. They have a very long uh, uh, planktonic uh, phase before they settle into an area. Uh, their larvae uh, finally settle. Uh, they're, they're spawned in the fall, and they finally settle the following spring. But because they have this long period of time that they're just floating around in the bay, carried by currents and wind, uh, they're relatively evenly distributed all over the place. So keep that in mind as we pursue this a little farther. I've been arguing that alewives were a key component in this, even though there's not many around today. So the issue really is, if alewives were so blessed, important to a codfish, then there should be evidence that that was true somewhere. Codfish all, that all of the time I was going ground fishing, which I did for 25 years, always moved offshore in the fall. That was a given. 
And you could chase them as far as you wanted to, but they weren't coming back until the next spring. And I'm saying a whole bunch of them did not, that they formed those coastal populations along the main coast that have disappeared. Well, let's see if they did. Let's see what evidence could be found. Back in the 19th, because what you need is uh, a couple of Elwife rivers that has documentation that there were actually Elwives there at the same time there were codfish there. And uh, here's the Talic uh, study again. But in the western end of that collapsed area is Muscungus Bay. And it has two rivers going into it. Secondary rivers, I describe them, because they're quite small compared to the Penobscot or Kennebec. Danascotter and St. George rivers have records going back to the 1920s. And that's great, because that fits my database for codfish. The young of your wives, when they left the bay, or when they left their uh, lakes and, and uh, emigrated from the rivers, uh, entered in opposite ends of the bay. And when they arrived there in the fall and late summer, uh, they were joining a whole bunch of Atlantic herring alwa. Uh, Atlantic herring period. So in those particular locations, you had an abundance uh, caused by them. But nobody really knew where young of your alewives went until the Maine New Hampshire Coastal Survey started going. Uh, they've been going now for over 10 years. So I took their database and extracted all of the survey toes over a 10-year period that were made that reported finding Elwives. Uh, unfortunately, I could only find five years out of the mix where there were reports of having caught Elwives in their sample toes. Here's where they were. I found it really interesting. That little yellow spot in between is Monhegan Island. And the St. George Elwives all seem to gather uh, on the east side, while the Damascotta River group seem to always end up on the other. And you end up saying, that doesn't really seem the way it ought to be. Aren't they supposed to scatter everywhere? Well, this data does not show it. Uh, and uh, it may well be. But this is what the data showed. OK, we know where the young of your alewives arrive at in the fall. Where are the cod? Right now, they're completely gone. If you wanted to go out here and have a cod for dinner, not only would it be illegal, but you'd spend an awful lot of time trying to find something. Uh, this is a map of a study I did, oh, back in the late 90s, uh, interviewing older fishermen, highline fishermen, about where codfish were once caught. Where did they reproduce? Where did you find ripe codfish? What's a ripe codfish, Cap? Uh, were the eggs running out of them? Or when you opened up, did the eggs look like tapioca pudding? Uh, did the eggs look as though they were too far developed so that you couldn't eat them? Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Here's the places that they identified where ripe cod, fisherman style, were found. Looks like they covered the entire coast, didn't it? Dozens of square miles of spawning habitat that were unknown in this air, whole area, most of which was small, discontinuous uh, spots of good habitat for it. Well, 
there's the spot. When you zoom in at where those codfish spawning grounds were, or locations where fishermen recorded catching ripe cod, that's where they were located. And there's Monhegan Island again. And I didn't carry all the circles along, uh, all of the, the smaller circles, but here's where the L wives ended up. And I said, this is really weird. Uh, I'm not sure I dare to acknowledge that because it's too coincidental. So I said, okay, let's see where codfish were in the summertime according to my 1920s data set, uh, which is in another paper I did in 2004 and see where they moved to uh, by the fall. And here's what I found. The stars are areas, fishing grounds, that reported schools of codfish in the summer that moved uh, to a place uh, in the fall. And the approach that I used in each case was what ground lost fish and what's the nearest ground that gained more fish. And we're not talking about individual fish, we're talking about a school of fish. If this whole room left and half of you went uh, to the dining room and the other half jumped in the cars, this, pro this approach would show part migrated and another part moved to that ground up there. You'll notice all of western Penobscot Bay codfish were migrating south. They didn't come around anywhere. Uh, and uh, codfish that were located south of Muscungus Bay didn't seem to be very interested in things either. They left the area, but those guys stayed. Let's look it over. 1965, Muscungus Bay cod collapsed. How do I know? I started fishing for ground fish out of Vinyl Haven in 1961. Sold my boat in 1964 with a condition that we go ground fishing in the spring. Uh, I was fishing around Matinica Seal Island and all of the guys that used to, from Vinyl Haven, that used to fish over near Muscungus Bay, suddenly were in my backyard. Their rationale was, there's nobody home over there, so we thought we'd come and see you. This happened after Muscungus Bay alewife landings dropped by more than half in a single year down from 1.8 million to about 700,000. And main landings for Atlantic herring dropped from about 75,000 metric tons of juvenile herring, sardines, 75,000 metric tons down to 30,000 metric tons. What an enormous reduction. Incidentally, Muscungus Bay was a hot spot for stop sailing, which is the method used it during that period of time uh, to capture juvenile herring in coves along the coast. Neat stuff. Sobering that you could relate it so close to such a huge reduction in prey rather than pollution or some such thing. And here is how it shook out. Cod did continue to be plentiful around the area that I fished. Uh, those fish were pretty abundant right up into the middle 1980s before we discovered the wonders of gill netting and new technology. And then between us and small draggers, uh, duplicated 
Hogel's observation, we have met the enemy, the card, and they is us <laughs> of the card. Yeah. They were still plentiful, and they were only maybe 20 years away. And incidentally, because of the rough terrain around Matinica Steel Island, it was impossible to stop saying at all. There was a healthy population of herring there that did reproduce there uh, for another couple decades, in fact. Pray again? I think so. So the question becomes, were Muscungus Bay simply overfished and they collapsed and that was the end of it? Or had they simply moved to better feeding grounds? I think it's a question that we need to find an answer for somehow. Uh, incidentally, to my knowledge, those cod have never showed up on these inshore grounds since. Well, the abundance we had in Matinica Seal Island continued until 1995. And during that year, the fall migration of adult and older juvenile herring moving from uh, Penobscot Bay south for their wintering, halfway between uh, Jeffrey's Bank and Cash's Ledge, just stopped. Now, that seemed like a puzzle to me when I asked my uh, dear uncle who had seined and dragged for most of his life, said, oh yeah, that happened back in, oh, 47. You wouldn't believe the whales and birds that were around. Of course, we were ground fishing then. Well, there was nobody in the seining business back then, not off there. But there were in 95. And they had a market called the Riga, which was a Russian processing ship that moored on the western side of the bay. Um, nearly 50,000 metric tons were landed that fall from that area. Cod disappeared from Matinica Seal Island, and the Jeffers Bank spawning group the last spawning group in the northeast collapsed, and we have had no codfish ever since that I know of. So let's sum up. In 1962, Muscungus Bay cod left when young of your allies and juvenile herring dropped sharply in a single year. That would make sense. Nobody's going to a restaurant that doesn't sell food. At least not more than once. 95, the last spawning group of cod collapsed in Jeffrey's Bank when Penobscot Bay herring became overfished and collapsed. And with no local reproduction left, cod disappeared from New England's northeastern coastal shelf and fishermen along with it. And now we all catch lobster. This somehow seems to suggest that Commissioner Baird may have been right. But why buy a pig in a poke? Let's look a little more closely at what happened. When cod left their inshore grounds, they also uh, abandoned those inshore spawning grounds that fishermen older fishermen told me about. Uh, the spawning grounds are the red splotches along there, and the gray areas were where National Marine Fisheries Service detected cod eggs uh, from the late 70s to the mid-late 80s. They were still there. But they, there weren't much inshore. Had the combined abundance of young of year alewives and herring attracted and held cod inshore through the winter? 
Rose and Richardson would probably agree because they found cod hyperaggregated wherever they found large bodies of lipid-rich prey. And our wives and herring certainly qualify for that. But the question is, if it's true, then what would the minimum threshold be? How many small lipid-rich prey individuals would be needed to attract a whole bunch of codfish and keep them in there all year long? And if they stayed there all year long, would they reproduce there? Once again, it's a good question. Well, calculating the ratio of young of year herring and young of year LYs to 1920s cod, which were probably much more abundant than they were back in the 60s, uh, gave these numbers. In 63, it would have been an estimated 118 million LYs and herring, young of year, would have occupied those two circles to give a ratio of about 1,300 prey per codfish. Now somebody, I hope, will ask me, how did you get that number? Because it's, uh, it may be the weak link in it, and I, I would challenge you to count me on it. In any case, with 1,300 lipid-rich prey, 1920s cod would have stayed there and reproduced. In 1964, after this great reduction, there were only 54 million critters. That reduced the ratio of uh, 600 lipid-rich prey per cod, and cod abandoned the area. And in the process, abandoned those inshore spawning grounds that fishermen had identified. Now, Rose and Richardson's observations indicated that given sufficient lipid-rich prey, the cod would stay there all year long, right through spawning season. What are you going to do if you're there? and you're ready to spawn, and you don't want to leave the feed, you'd have to spawn there. Now this is a long way from having exclusive little discrete populations of codfish. This suggests that this would be a mechanism that would function with a metapopulation of cod, which makes a lot of sense. But the catch is, if codfish do this, isn't that also describing what happens with Maine's cod spawning groups that disappeared on us? They had this abundance of lipid-rich prey, and they stayed right there because the young of year didn't go anywhere. They just went to a little deeper water in the wintertime where the water was warmer, right where the cod and the haddock and all of these other guys are going to camp. And when the number of prey species reduced below that threshold, all of a sudden, no codfish. The haddock didn't show. The pollock didn't pass through in the fall. And the whole business unraveled. Well, the missing cod groups all stayed inshore all winter. Uh, historical records show it. Anecdotal information from my hometown and most of these other towns that I've stopped and talked with identified the same thing. That wasn't unusual. They stayed where there was lots of food. And there were. But that means that rebuilding coastal spawning groups of cod again, as it, as it turns out, haddock as well, it kind of means that uh, alewives may be our best bet. 
the, uh, the number of alewives produced uh, in any given lake uh, with a connection to the sea is dependent on the surface area because they eat plankton and if you don't have the surface area in the lake you can't have that many. A guy by the name of Walton uh, did seven years of research on Damascotta Lake and found that for every female uh, there were between 1,700 and 25, 2,700 fingerlings leaving the river. Um, John Lichter and I played around with this when I was uh, 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 down at Bowdoin and uh, we came out with seven to nine times as much uh, nitrogen and, and phosphorus leaving the system uh, than would have been left behind had every single female that entered the system died, which they don't. So if you want to purify a lake, let the alewives in. They'll thin it out and make it better for, ha for salmon even. But the key is, how many of these guys are going to be enough? Well, it would seem that we need enough to at least reach the threshold limit uh, of something like 13,000 critters per codfish before we should expect too much. But with the Penobscot River coming online and the Kennebec River already somewhere between two and three million alewives a year, a long-term possibility of uh, the Union River opening which is the fourth largest watershed in the state, and the St. Croix opening up with a potential 14 million adult LYs per year, maybe we can do it. But it won't be getting just codfish. It will be getting a, a whole species assemblage of predator species back on the coast if we can figure out a management scheme that does the job. That's what I see for codfish. I see it as an incredible opportunity to rebuild a vibrant business for recreational fishermen, commercial fishermen, uh, sports fishermen, uh, party boats, but uh, better than that, a sustainable benefit of living in this beautiful place. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you. So Ted is happy to take some questions, but for the benefit both of others in the room and others who may watch this presentation on recorded video, if I could bring you a mic if you have a question, I would appreciate that. Even if you think you're nice and loud, uh, I'd appreciate if you would use the mic. Um. How does the counterclockwise gyre of the currents in the Gulf of Maine affect settlement patterns in the juvenile herring and, and alewives as they come out? Does it, do, they add, do they get moved along by the currents at all, or are they pretty much uh, A great question. Did everyone hear? Yeah. Very little is known about juvenile alewives. There's been a couple of studies that say they seem to disappear come wintertime, uh, obviously so. They're very small. Uh, they go to deeper water uh, and feed on benthic plankton. Uh, and when they show back up in the same general areas or inshore in the following spring, they're vastly reduced in numbers, which suggests to me that somebody ate a bunch of them along the way. But the, the uh, large 
gyre that circles Jordan Basin that you're describing, um, it's interesting because you have to go off the inner coastal shelf before you feel the effects of it. And what happens uh, between that location? In the mid-coast area, it's about halfway between Vinyl Haven and Matinicus. And you go farther down east, it's closer to the shore. Uh, uh, probably right along Muddy Reef area, would you say, Zach? Yeah. Uh, it leaves this whole inner area that still has credibly deep water out of the equation all the way. And in that area, you have tidal influence where water goes north and then northeast and then southwest, every tidal change. So it's kind of like sloshing water on the side of a tub, even though you have this prevailing uh, rotation counterclockwise rotation of the uh, main coastal current. It's a fascinating thing. Uh, the trick is trying to get somebody to study these inshore current patterns because they're so complex. Uh, most oceanographers don't want anything to do with it. I don't know if I blame them. Good question. So I have two questions. One is, recently there were some reports suggesting that some slightly positive sign for cod. Do you think that's related to it? Well, first of all, is it real? And if it is, could it be related to the dams coming down? And then secondly, would you expect the recovery, because cod, from what you're saying, tend to like to hang out in big groups, um, would you expect to see essentially almost no sign of recovery and then a really sudden increase as a result of their social behavior? Great questions. Uh, first of all, about cod starting to recover in certain places. Uh, one of the historic grounds, uh, when I was working down at, at uh, Bowdoin, uh, we worked with, with uh, a couple of researchers from the uh, University of Southern Maine who were doing, trying to catch codfish uh, because we'd started talking. John Lister and I had been exploring this. Well, uh, uh, um, Theo Willis and Karen Wilson was at USM were trying to catch fish to see if that might be the case. Uh, I think they caught two codfish all year. It might have been three, and they were little ones. Well, part of the argument had been that as these cod grew, well, codfish, when they're juveniles, uh, are almost strict invertebrate eaters. They eat clams and worms and mollusks and of other kinds and crabs and lobsters if they can find them, as one is foolish enough to crawl out in the daytime. Uh, but when they start to morph into adults, gonadal development requires a more lipid-rich diet. If you're a codfish or a haddock, as that goes, if you're this big, uh, you're not going to tackle an adult herring or an adult alewife that's this big. The eater might look at it and figure, I might become the ED and leave them alone. But when you take fingerlings this size, it's perfect for cod growing in an estuary with fingerling alewives and, and, uh, and fingerling herring to camp right there if there's a lot on them. Because the prey size is appropriate for the size of the predator. The second question, another good one because cod are broadcast spawners. Uh, they'll, especially the older ones, and they'll reproduce, release a few eggs uh, every few days for literally weeks at a time. Uh, young codfish, like we have dominating the population today, first-time spawners and even second-time spawners, they'll have it all at once, they go out. Well. When the eggs hatch, weeks, maybe even a month later, 
because of cold water temperature, depending on what it is, their survival depends on the plankton population around them. And if the plankton, if the zooplankton are larger than they are, guess who gets eaten? And none of them survive, or very few. And if uh, there's nobody home, they hatch too soon, they starve to death, and nobody's home. The frosting on the cake is that survivability of cod larvae uh, metamorphing into juveniles, uh, they don't last very long on the bottom, these little critters so big, uh, except in areas where gravel, gravelly sand is the right size that they can hide amongst the interstitials. If there are predators, if the interstitials are too large, there are already predators there. And once again, the little guy gets eaten. And if it's too small, like sure old sand, uh, there's no place to hide and they still get eaten. So the areas described where these codfish survive are relatively narrow strips. Uh, George's Bank towards the Northeast Peak area has where that, uh, George's Bank is weird because it has circular tides but it creates a gradation of particle size uh, that creates a large, relatively large area where the particle size is just right and survival rates are really super. And when I did this study on spawning grounds in Maine, way back uh, in coastal Maine, the areas people described to me where they caught ripe fish, if you examine them, many of them were potholes where tidal gyres uh, were causing uh, a gradation to occur. And some of them I had fished myself and could verify the, the, that there were current patterns that would affect that. So I think uh, I've gotten way off your question, Nancy. But I don't think there will be a fast recovery. Uh, I, I say no because uh, there are too many lobster traps around. There are too many fishermen who have been disenfranchised and not allowed to keep them if they caught them. And it becomes a real issue where we need a different strategy for how we manage this inshore area. I think hooks only so big that people go out and catch some but very strict limits on how many can be caught. But uh, Jeremy, you... So how is this going to translate into policy? First, I mean, are you being um, listened to uh, at NIMS, at the National Marine Fisheries Service? And do you see the sign of any um, change in policy as a reflection of your idea? Do they believe it? Um, it's, uh, uh, anecdotal information uh, is not easily or readily accepted by the scientific community. And much of my work is based on fishermen's reports, either recent or old. Uh, that said, the pieces are beginning to accumulate. A difficulty we have is that um, National Marine Fisheries Service manages the entire Gulf of Maine complex. Uh, George's Bank, 30, 35,000 square miles. Gulf of Maine, uh, 30 odd thousand, 32,000 square miles. Uh, these spawning areas may only be a mile or two across. And the fishing grounds themselves that historically are recorded are only a few miles across them. They were feeding stations for the 1920s data set that I have, uh, which means that all National Marine Fisheries Service can do in their stock assessment approach is to count the number of fish in the entire Gulf of Maine 
they can't see, even to this day, that there are no fish in uh, the eastern or the northern half of the Gulf of Maine, even though they know there's no fish there. For the simple reason that they're using average values. What's desperately needed is recognizing that ecosystems function at multiple levels, and you can't really see what's going on at uh, a different scale when you're at one. So fishermen can't see what's going on in microbia. Uh, nymphs can't see what's going on on the individual fishing grounds of the fishermen. The end result is it's a clean mess. Uh, I think, I th I, I think uh, National Marine Fisheries Service is trying very hard to figure out a way to introduce ecosystem management approaches to a management system that has 40 years of regulations justifying business as usual. It's not an enviable situation to be in. If it were me, ha ha, I would take inside area 1A, the 30 mile, it's about 30 miles outside the coast, uh, outside the coastline of Maine, for example. If you took that inner area, that includes all the spawning grounds for cod, for haddock. There used to be a few pollock. All the spawning grounds for uh, gray sole and, and dabs and winter flounder especially. Look at our halibut fishery that's coming back. You could rebuild the population that we're missing with the addition of appropriate amounts of prey and create an enormous fishery for the industrial fleet farther offshore if they would do it. But uh, no, I haven't been very successful in persuading anyone to do that, though we try. We'll probably take just a couple more. Yeah, Ted, we're, we're seeing, we've increased the numbers of the uh, LYs that are required to go in the Union River from 100,000 up to 315 this year, and we're pushing for more than that in the very near future. We've seen the Penobscot River LYs, we expected 50 or 60,000, we're seeing hundreds of thousands come back here. They had a five or 10 year uh, time frame for LYs come back, and, and the, some of us are, are seeing rapid re results even quicker than that. What is the correlation between the life cycle of the uh, codfish stocks and how fast they could reproduce, or what is their life cycle in, in uh, correspondence to the LYs, where it takes a, a few years for maturity? How about the codfish? And you know, when we start seeing the small ones, we're not gonna be able to count them much, but you know, when they get up to be the larger size, it's gonna be easier to, it's like anything, it's gonna be easier, oh look, there's more codfish. We're going to be able to spot them. How long is that going to take? Um, it's tricky. Um, if you have a resident population of cod, uh, even though it's relatively small, uh, the chances of a rapid recovery are good. And Massachusetts Bay has demonstrated that time and time again. We haven't demonstrated it up here because we simply cleaned them out. If you have to do like we're doing, which is wait for that main coastal current to bring enough Nova Scotian and Bay of Fundy uh, cod larvae into our estuaries, it may be a longer wait. Some of us have said, oh, you know, uh, let's, uh, Let's have uh, the, the aquaculture center that Maine has down in Franklin and spawn out a couple of million fingerling codfish and release them. I won't tell you what lobster fishermen say to that, but you can guess. And one of them is, oh, they'll eat all our lobsters. Uh, that's not exactly what would happen. 
But what will happen if that scene develops is that they won't have any access to those fish. And whatever landings they lose by predation from other fish uh, will happen to the ground fish industry. And if they're allowed to use auto trawling to catch those cod fish, they're going to catch their lobsters too. And all of a sudden, you have business as usual all through the system again. Right now, we have a few codfish showing up in, uh, uh, I hate to say it, in and around Booth Bay in the Kennebec area. There's been several years now where you've got these uh, large populations of fingling alewives entering the system. And you've got midwater trawlers trying to avoid any place where they're encountering alewives. So effectively, things are beginning. And it's kind of predictable. And of course, nobody has, is fishing up inside there anymore. So they're gaining. Uh, that could happen all over. I look at what's happened with our halibut fishery down east. Uh, we haven't had any dragging for 25 years. Uh, but what we do have is a robust population of growing all of it. And we have a management regulation that says, thou shalt keep no all of it smaller than 42 inches, which is the age of first reproduction. Which means that... Uh, all of those juveniles that used to go to market are safe. And I must confess, I have a halibut license too. We're allowed 25 per year, if you can catch them. Um, no more. Once you're tagged out, it's all over. It becomes, well, halibut's been uh, 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 commercial fishermen's salmon forever, and it's like cake and ice cream uh, to do. But uh, I see that as a model that could be used to develop a whole industry of small-scale fisheries. If you had that inner area that was safe from being cleaned out by highly efficient industrial operations. <coughs> and I don't Blame it all on the offshore trawlers. You know, I average about a half a million pounds of fish a year out of my uh, giant 43 foot gill netter, dragger, scalloper, whatever. Uh, and there were a great many others doing as well. When I tub trawl, I averaged a thousand weight of fish per tub out of a six-line tub. That's, uh, that's a fraction of what they do overseas. There were a lot of fish then. That should never happen again on this inshore bottom. But you could have people going out and catching a few thousand pounds of fish per week with no more. And if you violate the rule, you're not allowed to fish there anymore. It requires a different management structure, but I think it will come back reasonably soon. But it may not stay if we don't avoid the same pitfalls again. <coughs> One more, okay? Ted? Oh, sure. Okay. We'll make this the last question. Ted, one of the things that I'm mostly concerned about is the bycatch killing of fish, and the fact that there are so many striped bass that have been recently you know, proven to have been caught and just allowed to expire. Um, and I'm going to go away from that now. But you said something about obeying the rules. Not getting caught is not obeying the rules, because a lot of people don't obey the rules, and they're killing a lot of fish. And one of the questions I have about the codfish, codfish is a deep water fish, is that correct? They like cold water. What's going to happen 
as our waters warm, is that going to affect those that fishery? Uh, That's the major question. Uh, cod uh, are not a particularly deep water fish. Uh, that's one of the reasons why the Gulf of Maine used to be so productive. Uh, they do like colder water, cooler water, uh, but they tolerate uh, a ridiculous variation in salinities and temperature. In fact, when there used to be a few codfish around, the places you went to find them were shoals where you had a deep hole alongside. The deep water nice and cool, when it's feeding time, like slack tide and all of the young fish are on top, the codfish come up and prey on them. And then when either they fill their belly and go back to deeper water or they, uh, uh, the tide starts running and they'll go on the down tide side. But they're, they're attuned to it. They evolved with these changes. Cod have been around for longer than the last ice age, I'm sure. But I don't know. I wasn't around at the time. Um, bycatch is a ferocious problem. If you can imagine trying to avoid bycatch when your net is twice as big as this building, uh, and you're towing it at five to six knots, um, you can't do it. The only protection you can create is to prevent those types of operations. Even a two or three hundred foot net from a typical otter trawl or ground fishing is a huge operation. If you put it on these inshore pieces of bottom that are fundamentally critical habitat for a whole suite of species, then you're asking for it. And as much as I love dragging, you sit in there drinking coffee and smoking your pipe, hauling back every three or four hours, faster crewmen, <laughs> and gill netting when the fisherman does most of the work, but if you know your business, it's incredibly effective. You need to push all of that outside Inside, if you want to fish a trap where you can leave fish, release fish alive, are hooks that are reasonably selective by virtue of gape size of the hook and uh, the type of bait you're using, great. But you'll never get it any other way, and you'll never preserve good quality fishing for the steel boats until you create a management strategy that creates that inner layer where fish can reproduce and grow to maturity without being cleaned out. Good questions. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, everybody, and I hope the conversations will continue.